Today on Garage Fab, we design and build tabs to connect our new link bars to our narrowed Mustang axle on the Mighty Max. And then we're gonna watch the whole thing work. Hey Garage Fabbers, it's a weekday and I'm in the garage. So that's new. This past weekend, I tested positive for cooties. The whole family actually. We're all doing fairly well, but needless to say, I'm not welcome to work. So I'll take advantage of this forced vacation and work on a video. Excuse the voice. If you're just joining, we've been building a parallel four link on my wife's Mighty Max. So far, we've got the link bar cross member in place with tabs installed, four identical length link bars made, and the axle centered in the wheel opening in the fully lowered position. All that's left for the four link itself is creating some tabs to connect the link bars to the axle. It'll be a little more complex than just purchasing some tabs and welding them on. We need to make sure the parallel four link works like a parallel four link should by matching the axle tabs to the tabs on the cross member. A properly working four link will have equal length bars, check, and those bars will be parallel. That's what we're working on right now. A lot of today's episode will take place on my kitchen table. On this cardstock, still my favorite tool ever, we're gonna draw out both the upper and lower axle tabs in actual size and in their proper orientation. After doing that, we'll have cardstock templates that we can trace onto steel plate and create the real thing. We're gonna use the lower edge of this cardstock as a reference point to base everything off of. And using a square, I'll make a line directly up the middle. This line will be the axle center line. On that line, we're gonna draw a circle that represents the axle tube. The axle tube has a total diameter of two and three quarters inches. We need to split that in half to get the radius to which we'll set the compass to. That's one and three eighths inches. Somewhere near the middle of the cardstock, set the pivoting point of the compass on the line and draw your circle. Bam, we have an axle. Now, where to locate the link bar bushings? If you recall from previous videos, we built tabs that would space out the front link bar bushings exactly 10 inches. So to keep the bars parallel, the rear bushings also need to be 10 inches apart. The big question is, will the axle be centered between those bushings? Will the upper bushings be closer to the axle? Or vice versa? Here's the two things you need to take into consideration before deciding. One, total arc of the link bars you're using. And two, link bar angle. The height of the link bar arc can be determined mathematically, but you can also cheat like I do. Draw a line on your bench or the ground that's longer than your link bar. This line will represent the bar's level position. Set the link bar on that line. Lock one end down so it can only pivot, and using a marker in the opposite end, use the bar like a compass to draw part of a circle. Now determine your air spring's total stroke. I'm using seven inch Slam Specialties air springs that have a nine inch total stroke. I find it takes a lot of air pressure to get that last inch of stroke, so let's just say my air springs have eight inches of treble. Now divide that in half and using a square, slide it on the line until the arc touches the four inch mark and draw a line. Do that again under the line for a total of eight inches. This distance here is the total forward and backward movement of the axle. So with an eight inch travel, if I install my bars so that they're level at four inches, the total movement of the axle is five sixteenths of an inch. This is important to understand because if your axle is moving forward and backward, your drive shaft is too, which is the reason for the drive shaft slip yoke. I personally don't want my bars to be parallel with the ground at half travel. I prefer my bars to be angled downward near half travel, what I call the performance ride height of three inches. This angle will provide some anti-squat properties. Cue the tangent. When a vehicle accelerates, the axle pushes the vehicle forward. Because of inertia, the weight of the vehicle body shifts backward, causing the rear suspension to drop. That's squat. Anti-squat is a suspension design that resists this drop. By angling the links downward with the lower bars pointed roughly at the vehicle's center of gravity, you get a neat result. Now when we accelerate, forward force is channeled through the link bars, pushing upwards on the frame, reducing squat. Even more interesting is it doesn't change inertia. The weight of the body still shifts to the rear, but instead the force is channeled back through the bars forcing the tires into the ground, increasing traction. Wow. 
Proper anti-squat is a lot more complex than just aiming your lower bars at your vehicle's center of gravity. If you want to truly understand anti-squat, I highly recommend doing more research on race car suspension. But race cars aren't bagged, so they don't need parallel four links like we do. That said, this angle is just an attempt to help squeeze a little performance out of your non-performance parallel four link. It's far from perfect, but I can tell you that my V8 mini truck had bad traction and no squat. In order to get the anti-squat angle that worked so well at a three inch ride height, that meant my link bars were parallel to the ground when the truck was laid out. Let's talk about what that meant for axle movement. It's a tangent in a tangent. Whoa. Let's measure the link bar arc again, but this time the entire eight inches of travel will be below the level point. The total front to back movement of the axle is now one and one eighth inches. That's almost four times the axle movement. That's got to be too much, right? Well, it's actually a little less than an inch and an eighth because the drive shaft also swings on an arc. So some of that movement is canceled out. That gets really confusing and I need to stop with the tangents. So it'll have to wait for a suspension basics episode called third links, where we discuss how drive shafts, CV joints and tie rods fit into suspension design. So for now, let's just look at the drive shaft slip yoke to see if one and one eighth inches of movement would even be okay. The total length of the slip yoke on the Mighty Max is three and a half inches. And as a general rule of thumb, there should be a minimum of two inches of spline engaging the transmission output shaft at all times. That means we only have one and a half inches of usable slip yoke. So one and one eighth inches of axle movement is acceptable, barely. Hopefully that made some sense. If it didn't, I just wasted my breath because I can't even have that bar angle I've been raving about. With the axle held in the laid out position, I cannot level the bars. The upper bars hit the axle. The only way I could make that happen is to cut everything apart and relocate the front link bar mounts higher off the ground. My wife won't be racing this truck though, so I'm just gonna take what I'm given. On the bright side though, this will put the bars closer to level at half travel, which means much less axle movement. So to try and get the most anti-squat angle possible, I'm going to mount the upper bushings as close to the axle as possible. To accurately position the bushings on the cardstock, we have to revisit and use everything we've learned while making the rear suspension so far. In the last episode, we made upper link bars that matched the length of the lower bars. Why? Because I'm lazy and I didn't want to remake the lower bars. Those upper bars ended up falling a half inch short of the axle center line. So on the cardstock, I'll draw a line a half inch forward of the axle center line. The upper bushings will be located on this line. In the episode before that, in order to keep the link bar bushings from rubbing the cross member, we made link bar tabs that push the upper bushings a half inch further back than the lower bushings. So for the lower bushings, we'll draw a second line a half inch further forward than the first one, or an inch forward from the axle center line. This line is where the bottom bushings will be. As I mentioned earlier, I've decided to put the upper bushings as close to the axle as possible. But again, to keep them from rubbing the axle, we'll give a half inch clearance. Now, in order to make our parallel four link parallel, the rear bushings need to be vertically spaced the same as the front bushings. Again, in the cross member tab video, we decided to mount the upper bushings 10 inches above the lowers. So on the axle, the lower bushings will be 10 inches below the uppers. Pay attention to your overall wheel diameter when doing this, meaning the wheels with tires installed. I'm running a 26 inch tire, so my lower tabs hanging down six inches is a lot, but it should be okay. But if I chose 17 inch wheels with low profile tires like I did back in 1998, these lower tabs would hang down below the tire. That would suck. Dragging mini trucks are cool. Dragging suspension components is not. We now have the specific locations of the axle side link bar bushings. Let's draw in the bushings and then connect the outer edges of the circles to find out what the axle tabs will actually look like. Pay no mind to the upper link bar tabs. I've got plans for the top of the axle that I'm not ready to reveal yet, mostly because I don't know exactly what I'm doing yet. The drawing portion is done, so cut them out to get you some templates. We've already converted cardstock templates to steel once before, so if you're like, whoa, what is this sorcery? Go check out this video right here. For those that have seen it already, enjoy this frantically sped up video with some music you may or may not like.
So now that your axle tabs are made, the big question is, how do you position them properly before you weld them on? It's a fun one to answer because you just put them on. You cannot do it wrong. Assuming that you've been following what we've been doing on this channel to a T, meaning the axle is locked into position both up and down and front to back, your link bars are made to their proper length, and you created the axle tabs the way we did on the cardstock today, the only position that you can install them is the proper position. If you seat the notch for the axle tube on the axle tube and try to rotate it in any position, you will not be able to get the bolt to go through unless it is in the exact position it's supposed to be in. The lower tabs are no different. You can rotate them around the axle tube, but you will not be able to get the bolt in until it is in the exact position it's supposed to be in. The only things that you need to pay attention to is that the axle is centered between the frame rails before welding the tabs on, they're equal distant away from the end of the axle or from the brake backing plates, and you need to set the pinion angle properly. Unfortunately for me, I don't have a transmission or an engine installed yet, so I don't even know what my pinion angle is going to be. Your pinion angle for a vehicle that's driven on the street should match the engine and transmission shafts. Meaning, if the engine and transmission are at zero degrees, the pinion angle should also be at zero degrees. If your engine and transmission are pointed down three degrees, your pinion angle should be pointed up three degrees. That will ensure that the shafts inside the transmission and inside the differential are parallel to one another. And since we've built a parallel four link, that parallelness will always be parallel no matter what height the truck is at. Like I said, I don't know what my pinion angle is going to be. So today I'm just going to set the pinion angle at zero degrees, lightly tack the tabs on just so that we can see everything work. And when I get an engine installed, I can just cut it off and set it properly then. I got the link bar tabs tacked into place. I think it's time we cut the temporary axle mounts off and see how we did. Nice. This is one of the most gratifying times when building suspension. Not quite as gratifying as getting the air management system working, but we're getting there. It's the moment of truth. Let's cycle the suspension with an angle finder on the drive shaft flange and see if the pinion angle stays the same, which is kind of the entire point of the last several videos. The parallel four link is working exactly as a parallel four link should. I'm super excited. It's time to move on. You're probably wondering why the upper tabs are so dang big. I know I would be. I could tell you, but then you would have 
no reason to come back and watch the next episode. So hit the subscribe button. We've got a few finishing touches for the axle before we move on to the Watts link. So until then, my friends, keep moving forward.